afternoon, everyone. This meeting always packs the house. I'm not sure why. I made sure Chef made some extra good appetizers for today. Um, but I, I want to kick off today's meeting. We have some folks in the back that are still waiting in line for refreshments. But I'll start by announcing our employees of the month for the month of uh, October. And in independent living, it's Mariana Grimaldo. She is a housekeeper. So congratulations to Mariana. For assisted living in the Arbors, it's Ashley Vasquez. And she is the business office manager um, for assisted living in the Arbors. And she does a fabulous job. So congratulations to her. And at Plaza West, it's Rita Murray, and she works in nursing. So congratulations to those folks. And for those of you who don't know, um, you are able to nominate employees for Employee of the Month by sending myself or the department manager an email, just sort of outlining why they deserve um, to win the award. And then we collect all those nominations throughout the month, and then our Employee Extraordinary Commission uh, Impressions Committee um, votes on them. So we take the names out of the nominations and they're just read the description and then they vote on the winner from each area. So those folks get a primo parking spot uh, as well as 400 extraordinary rewards points and that's the equivalent to $100. And they're able to redeem those points for items in an online catalog. So our employees love getting points. They are competitive. They want to see who has the most points. Some of those folks like to save up for big items. Some of them spend them right away. Like I like to spend my money. Um, but a very good program. So hope to keep getting those nominations. No, that's no good. And we'll get started on uh, the presentation. Um, last year when we did this, Dennis had just started in his role as Director of Financial Services, so I let him off the hook. Um, but this year I am giving him a couple slides to go over, so he'll be up in a few minutes. Um, but one I'll highlight here, so first I'll say, we're gonna email this presentation out to everybody, and Stephanie will have hard copies. So as we go through the slides, don't worry if you don't miss a number, if you miss a number of some information, you will receive a copy, whether that's via email or you stop and pick up a hard copy. I always highlight on here that it's 2024. All the information that we're gonna talk about is related to your the 2024 operating budget as well as the 2024 monthly service fee increases. Because we do increases on anniversary dates, some of you are just getting your individual letters for the 2023 increase. So that's still going in effect. So if you normally get your increase in December, uh, November or December, this is what's gonna tell you what it's going to be next year. Not this year, next year. So just some information, general information about our budget process. So um, we prepare the budget locally. Um, Dennis and I do that with the help of our department heads. Um, we put together um, revenue um, projections as well as our expense projections. And then our uh, life care services partners help us with that. So our regional sales partner will say, here's what we anticipate spending on some advertising and things like that next year. So they help us with some budget guidance, but we put it all together here locally. And then our regional vice president of operations, that's Mary Mackey, and most of you have met her and seen her at the community before. She presents that budget to Health Peak, and Health Peak is our owner, and they, are, they have the final approval of our budget. Also, as part of that process, uh, we include the residents in discussions about the, uh, the budget as we put it together. We include the RAC president and designated representative. We include the ROC chairman or designee, as well as the finance committee chair or designee. So all these people get in a room and Mary Mackey comes and we go through the budget pretty much at the point of where it's at a in a first draft mode. And so we explain, we answer questions, and we talk about how we arrived at those numbers. And all those components, they include occupancy, which generates our revenue, 
It includes our labor, wages, and benefits, as well as our other expenses like food and maintenance supplies and healthcare supplies and utilities and things like that. So I'm gonna touch on this. So capital projects, that's not part of our operating budget. That's a whole different process. So capital projects are things like renovations and replacement of major equipment and systems at the community if we wanna do paving or install some electric car chargers, things like that, they're capital projects. And so that's a separate budget process. And I think I did mention it at the last town hall meeting. We submitted a list of 29 projects for next year. And so that's, that's given to Health Peak for review and then they decide um, what's approved for the 2024 capital budget. The operating budget, which we talk about today, is what impacts your monthly service fee. So capital projects are separate from monthly service fee increases. So example, if we do a big renovation next year of the Plaza building like we've been talking about, that does not impact monthly service fee increases. That's sort of a separate bucket of money. What drives your monthly service fee is the everyday expenses that we experience here at the community. So, and this is just covering what are some challenges that we've seen this year that we had to consider when we did our budget for next year. So right now, Plaza West, um, their, occup their occupancy is a little bit behind budget for the year, um, which creates a revenue deficit, but also the payer mix at Plaza West is creating a revenue deficit. And when I say payer mix, I mean, we have the option of four different funds that pay for stays at Plaza West. One is Medicare, one is managed care, one is Medicaid, and one is private pay. So we also we have to budget the number of people we think are going to be at Plaza West, but we also have to budget the number of each of those payers we think is going to make up that total number. And when that that distribution is off from what we plan, it can create a revenue deficit as well because all of those payers pay us a different amount of money. Also, life care expense. So the discount you all get for being a life care resident at Freedom Plaza when you transition to a higher level of care because you keep that independent living monthly fee, um, we, we under planned for that this year. So. In, at Plaza West, we're about $316,000 of life care expense more than what we anticipated um, to this point in the year. And for assisted living in the Arbors, we're about $209,000 more than what we planned on. So budget, budgeting is, a, is, a, is an educated guess, essentially, right? And a lot of times we look at historical data to determine what we think is going to happen the following year, and that doesn't always translate to an accurate guess. So um, we did plan um, to get that more in line for next year. Lastly, I'll mention, um, and we've talked a lot about it, not as much recently, which is a good thing. Um, last year we had almost a million dollars of contract labor expense, which is essentially agency nurses and caregivers at Plaza West and assisted living in the Arbors. Well, this year we, we have reduced that down to about $167,000. So big improvement year over year, but it was still an unplanned expense. But the good news is we are not using it anymore. That $167,000 was really through about the first half of the year. And we've been real successful in filling our, our vacant positions in those areas. So I'm gonna call Dennis up and, and let him take care of his part of the presentation. Can you hear me? Okay, we're on. Um, so now we're going to take a look at the uh, move-ins, move-outs. We've had a great 2023 so far. We're hoping for a strong fourth quarter, and then we're hoping this carries right on through into the new year. Um, so we're budgeting 49 sales in 2024. Um, it's an uptick from what we were budgeting in 23, but you know things continue to move in the right direction. And then in terms of move outs, we are budgeting 42. So we're looking at a net plus seven uh, to the community. 
And a move out is made up of any time you have a, all the residents in the unit move out. So if you have one just transfer, it wouldn't be considered a move out, but if, if there was just one to begin with or both moved out, at that point, it's considered a move out. And then, you know, the various uh, reasons that someone would move out would be if they transfer to a higher level of care, assisted living, you know, memory care, whatever. And then uh, other situations would also be if there's a situation where they need to move out to move closer to family, uh, or of course, if there's a situation uh, where they pass, those would all be situations where um, you have a move out. This next slide is taking a look as we look at 2024 in total to get a feel for what we budget for our occupancy by level of care. And in independent living, again, taking all the move-ins, move-outs throughout the, the year, we're looking at uh, an average occupancy of 383.8 units out of 425, which is right about 90.3%. Uh, you've heard you know, Angie talk about trying to get to that 90% range. We were right on the verge of that now, and we are um, forecasting that that's where we'll be for the year, all of 2024. In assisted living, uh, we are budgeting 78.5 occupancy out of 83, 94.6%. And then in the health center, uh, we are budgeting 99 out of 113, or 87.6%. So just kind of some overall, you know, what it boils down to, what are the key dynamics that we face that, that go into this budgeting process. Um, the biggest cost category that we have here is our wages and benefits. Um, for the wages and benefits for our employees are somewhere between 60 to 65% of our total operating expenses. So it's a huge driver has a huge impact. And our wages have increased significantly over the last couple of years. We've had to do some wage adjustments and, and to deal with market conditions. Management and residents want to recruit and hire highly qualified, competent, friendly employees at Freedom Plaza. And we want to keep exemplary people we already have on our team. Obviously, if we have really talented people, we want to make sure to keep them here. So these continued wage pressures are gonna be still part of the process for the next few years. Back in 2021, the minimum wage um, law went into effect. It's like over a six year phase in. It started out at $10 an hour in 2021, and minimum wage goes up $1 every year until the year 2026 when it hits $15 an hour. So we're about halfway through that process. And even though we don't necessarily have employees that necessarily a lot of employees that make that, it has a trickle up effect that we have to deal with. So that's just a continued pressure we're gonna to continue to deal with for the next few years. And then um, in addition to those types of expenses, we you know, have continued inflationary pressures in our larger expense categories, such as food, uh, obviously insurance, you know, the litigious environment we're dealing with, and whether it's that or uh, all the other various insurances we deal with, that's always um, gonna be an issue we deal with as well as higher healthcare expense. And, and I'll just piggyback on a couple of things Dennis said, um, the minimum wage. So probably the, you know, we only have maybe a handful of jobs here that would hang around the minimum wage category. But what that does is every time that ticks up, every employee above that has to go up. So it's, it's, a, it's a cumulative effect as the minimum wage goes up, we have to really factor in compression for our employees that have been here a long time and um, need, are in an above minimum wage position. All those people have to get wage adjustments as the minimum goes up. So you all know what your contract says about um, my monthly service fee increases. So contractually, the cap on your monthly service fee increase is the increase in the consumer price index plus up to 2%. We measure that increase to determine the cap from August to August every year. 
And I think I was I met with a group of residents yesterday, and we talked a lot about this. Um, CPI is representative of a, a market basket of goods like fuel, um, food, um, housing, things like that. Everything that makes up the CPI market basket. The one thing the CPI market basket doesn't account for is our wages and benefits, which is our largest expense at the community. So um, CPI for August to August was 4.3%. Um, and so next year we are adding the 2% and it will be 6.3% for um, 2024. And that would take place on your anniversary date. Um, the good news is it's a lot less than this year. Um, if you're looking for a silver lining and I, I'm thinking it's heading in the right direction and I, I don't want anybody to think that I um, don't appreciate the significance of the increases as I've had conversations with residents a lot this year. Um, I sat down and looked at what my homeowner's insurance has done in the last three years and what my flood insurance has done in the last three years and my car insurance and everything else. But I think what makes it a little less painful for me, it's not one big bill, right? It's spread out over the course of uh, several different bills. But we're, we're experiencing the pressures that everybody is um, when it comes to expenses and also the wages we have to pay our employees, which sort of drives the need for, for these monthly service fee increases. And then the other um, ancillary services, um, I don't anticipate um, much, much movement there, maybe a small increase on those. And we are gonna send out our additional price sheet um, with the letter. So you will get a letter that summarizes all this, as well as a copy of the additional services price sheet um, on or before next Tuesday. It might be sooner than that. I think it's gonna come with the bill. Is that correct, Dennis? It'll come with your November bill. So as you um, look over those things, have time to sort of digest the, the presentation, happy to set up times to meet with you individually, Dennis is as well. Um, but at this point, does anybody have any questions? Here, over here, who has a microphone? Dennis is coming here to grab your question. Hi, Angie. I got a letter saying my fees went up to 11.4. So that's for this year. Yeah, right that's, that's that'll seven, be in december that's seven thousand dollars a year more than i'm paying now mm -hmm. i think it's very extravagant that's all i have to say okay and, I, and again I, I appreciate the significance and and we've talked a little bit about this as we've had meetings throughout the year um but just to put a number to uh, some of the things that i'm referencing here if you look at our wages and benefits uh, in 2019 and then you look at what they're projected to be in 2023, they're at $5 million higher per year. So we can't, we can't just, we can't not increase fees to cover those expenses. Um, we would completely erode any margin that the community makes and, and that's not a good business decision. Two questions. First one, in terms of average occupancy by level of care, we did not have memory care on that list. Can you tell us what that is? Sure, and we actually talked about that before the meeting. Um, Dennis does have that. I think it's the average occupancy. We have a capacity there of 28. It's gonna be 24.6 for, that's what we budgeted for the year next year. Um, and we'll, we'll add it to the presentation before we send it out and before we make hard copies. So we'll include that um, on, on what we distribute. Thank you. Second question. Um, the total increase in the operating budget from 2022 to 2023, how much is it? Tw you mean from last year to this year? Yes. And from a revenue perspective or from expenses? No, from an expense perspective. So uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I think what we looked, at, what we saw when we looked at expenses, our biggest jump, again, and not to sound like a broken record, was in our wages and benefits, but I'm happy to get that information and email it to you. 
Yes, I would be very interested to see that because to me, in aggregate, the in increase should not exceed the increase in expenses. Sure. And you have to also consider that the way we determine the cap is, is always like looking backwards, if you will. So we're looking at last year to determine next year's increase. So sometimes when we do that, our, our increase is higher than current expense inflation, but sometimes it's the other way around. So when you look, I think more of a more accurate way to look at it, I'll show you 21 to 22 and then 22 to 23. And that's going to paint a bigger picture if you combine those two years of increases as to why they had to be the way they were. What is the uh, minimum wage, Angie? So right now it's $12. And then in uh, September of next year, it'll go to 13 and then 14 and then 15. It goes up in September of every year. What, what is the logic in raising everyone's salary, uh, our, our salary based upon increase in minimum? So if you had somebody that was making $5, I'm just making this up as an example. If you had somebody that was making $5 above minimum wage when it was $8, right, and you increase minimum wage to 15, you can't you can't leave that person at minimum wage, right? They're in a job that commands more than minimum wage. So as you increase minimum wage, it increases the the market weight wage for all those other positions. So as an example, um, CNAs who work at Plaza West um, pre-pandemic, they made um, $14 an hour on average. Now they start at $18 an hour. And before the pandemic, we paid shift differentials and we've talked about that before. So shift differentials are from the folks that work those um, not so attractive shifts, the evening, overnight, and on weekends. So when you work those shifts, you get an additional hourly rate. Um, and pre-pandemic, it was maybe a dollar for the evening, two dollars overnight, and three dollars on weekends. Well, that's gone to three dollars, four dollars, and five dollars. So you, and it, well, it's not because that was the only, that was what the market commanded. We have to adjust our wages um, to be in accordance with what the market, market says they need to be. And I had dinner with uh, residents and we were talking about this, and Freedom Plaza doesn't does it try to be the highest paid employer in the market, highest paying employer in the market? And we try not to be the lowest paying employer in the market. We try to be right somewhere in the middle because we think we offer a pretty competitive um, benefits package to our employees, which is also very meaningful to them. Things like paid time off, 401k match, health benefits, that, that's a big factor when people are considering where they're gonna work. And so as long as we keep those things competitive, which also have a price tag, we don't have to be the highest paying employer in the area. Thank you. I was just wondering if there ever could be a cap, could there ever be a cap on that CPI? Well, I don't determine CPI, so that's something you have to take up with the government. Um, <laughs> Right. Sets. No, the corporation doesn't set CPI. The contract is the one what sets the maximum at the CPI plus two. So you can't go above that. That is a cap. We're like sitting ducks. Where yeah. does it end? And if you add it every year for inflation, where is it going to end? If I could control inflation, I would gladly do that for you. And I would do it for myself. But I can't. And it doesn't change our business at all. So we still have to buy food. We still have to employ people. We still have to clean apartments. We still have to maintain apartments and maintain the community, all of which requires money. And we have to pay what people charge us. So I can't control how much our expenses go up every year. Um, and I, I wish I could, but I can't. Well, could it ever be brought up to corporate? I can certainly bring it up. And I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, right? Um, but what I will share is I, I, I talk to a lot of other um, 
executive directors in the city who work at communities that are outside our organization and their contracts don't have any sort of cap on their increase. And so I know of one community in Sarasota that increased rates 17% this year. So, I mean, I'm not telling you to be grateful for the significant increases I'm giving you, but it could be worse. It could be worse. And I think that's a really good thing that we have in our contracts, that there is a cap, because many places do not cap their increase. Well, I appreciate the 2% cap. And so I was wondering, you know, if corporate might consider putting a cap on the CPA. CPI. Yeah, well, that's that's determined by the government. So we well, can't cap it. That is, but, you know, they can be mm -hmm. At what point does it ever stop? No, I, I, I appreciate your question. Tommy? Yeah, I was just wondering, you say it, that uh, it's CPI with plus up to 2%. Correct. Have you ever gone below 2%? We have. We yeah. ever consider it seriously, ma'am? Um, well, I mean, with inflation and wage pressures the way we are right now, I, I would say it hasn't been considered in the last three years. But do I think there's a possibility in the future that we may not use the full 2%? Sure, I do, because the first 12 years that I worked here, I would say half of them we didn't use the full 2%. Well, we should have been living here. Yeah. You should have moved in sooner. I think one way to try to understand, for years, a lot of us, interest on money took care of this. Yeah. And a lot of years, uh, look back to your parents. My parents could never have lived today. And a lot of people couldn't because I've been here 10 years and when I first moved in, the interest kind of covered things. And even Social Security went up a little bit but the cost didn't go up a lot. So you could, you could live with it. To, nobody ever thought it'd go up to 9.4%. You know. No, I mean, I don't think anybody would have, would have predicted that and for sure. Things get better. They, 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 they settle. And, and the CPI will go down, but I understand we have no control, you have no control over that, and nobody does except what's happening in Washington. That's correct. So write your senators and congressmen. I got, I'm seeing lots of hands. Someone recently, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Someone recently said that the new residents moving in weren't gonna get an uh, increase in their uh, maintenance for a period of time is that true or no so um there was an incentive offered at the end of last year to give them sort of credit back for this year's increase but it's still built into the compounding factor as it moves forward so no we don't waive increases i mean ever i mean we've asked for that as a marketing incentive to be quite honest and that's a big end big o Well, I was just wondering, with all these numbers you've thrown up here, is how we can justify decreasing the buy-in and uh, allegedly decreasing the monthly rentals to the newcomers. Well, so there's no de decrease in the in the monthly service fees for new people moving in, other than we, they might get a few months free up front until their apartment's renovated and they move in. And I'm pretty sure most people that are in here um, receive that same that same discount. As far as discounting the entry fee, um, we're really offering minimal discounts. And I'm sure if you talk to um, somebody on the finance committee, they'll they'll back me up on that. We do offer minimal entry fee discounts for the apartments that we. It's sort of a supply and demand thing. If we the the apartment type that we have the most of or that has been vacant the longest because it has maybe a less than seller view, um, we will offer small discounts on the buy-in there, but compared to what we've offered in the past, it's really, it's pretty insignificant. Well, you know, we get creative in how we advertise that, right? 
So we say up to, and folks come in and they say, well, I want the apartment that I get $100,000 off of. And then when they see that apartment, that's not the one they want. So, do you have a question, Cyril? I'll repeat it if you just want to say it. There's no conversation about the cumulative effect on residents who have been here for considerable time. Right. And so um, I have to ask about that. The cumulative effect, I hear a lot of people talk about when I run out of money, I'm going to be staying here. Mm -hmm. How many um, small apartments are available when we're all flocking to them? Right. How? Yes. So where is that in your conversation here with your projections? Where is that conversation in the algorithms that were used in calculating our financial viability 10 mm -hmm. years ago, 12 years ago? And of course, we all hope that we're going to live for a very long time. Well, I hope so too. And I'll, uh, so I'll answer, there's sort of multi-questions in there. So how is that, how is the compounding effect of the monthly service fee factored into the financial qualification process when folks move here? So I think what's, what's built into the model is four and a half percent, which was very applicable for a long time. Um, it's not applicable uh, over the last two years and, and next year. So um, there, is a, there is a factor that in the model now, at that point, you know, we weren't anticipating the economic conditions we're in. So is, do we think that maybe over the course of the next five years, the folks that have been here for 10, 12, 14 years may run into a period, like that financial hardship situation? Uh, absolutely, I mean, we know that. Um, and, and believe me, I know it, Dennis knows it, um, Mary Mackey knows it, and everybody that is aware and involved in the bud budget process understands the impact of the, the compounding increase. And so I think the, the response to that is, is that's why we have that care for life guarantee in that, in that uh, contract, that if you do live to be 110, and I hope everybody does, um, that we will take care of you. And if we don't have smaller apartments to move you to at that time, then you get to stay right where you are. So, um, you know, we're always gonna make a reasonable decision when those situations pre present themselves. And I think we have so far um, for the folks that we've worked with. So everybody's acutely aware and understands the potential impact down the road. Um, but we also need to, to adjust our monthly fees in a way that, that keeps the, the business running in, in a good way. Other questions? Well, you were pretty easy on me. Well, I appreciate everybody coming. That was really the meat of our meeting today. Um, if you want to get more refreshments, there's stuff in the back, drinks. And um, Dennis and I will stick around if you have any questions you want to talk to us about. Thank you very much.